All right, everybody, we're going to go live a little bit early tonight. Start the show still at 6.30, but we're going to have a guest, Bruce Tanya, today. So uh, we want to be sure we've got our glitches ironed out. We uh, did a little test a few minutes ago, 30 minutes ago or so, and we were able to figure it out. So Bruce, if you're now watching this video, go ahead and acknowledge your presence, and then let me invite you on and we'll go ahead and get you on so we can start the show right at 6.30 and get rolling with it. Make some good things happen. Talk about some of the things going on with you. So uh, let's see here. I want to make sure. Let's see, we got three people on, so I know it, I know we're live. We're, folks that are watching, we're going to be on here a little bit early so I can get Bruce Kanya on and see if we can't get this thing ready to go where we can start right at 6.30. Now I'm looking on my laptop, because it's 6.30, I'm gonna crank this thing up and we're gonna roll with it. And I'm hoping that we can get Bruce Kanye to join us right now, so we don't have to waste any time at 6.30 to get it going. All right, I see Matt Singh Lynn is looking. Lynn, what I'm trying to do is figure out how to get Bruce on before we really get going. So now I'm waiting on Bruce to say something. All right, so now, all right. Hello, Pat Williamson, Matt Singley, John Krause. John, you're gonna be pretty interested in hearing this. This is some pretty cool stuff that if if we can get uh, Bruce Kanye on, Bruce is from Shepherd, Montana, and man, this guy, he's an inventor. I, I met him years and years and years ago. I've been to Montana several times. He and his bride, Ann, have been to Texas a number of times. They've been to a bunch of the Pond Boss conferences. And Bruce is the guy that invented floating islands. So what I'm hoping to do is start a little bit early and get him on here and uh, see if we can make this show roll where I can kick things off right at 6.30. So, Bruce, if you're watching, and if you're watching... Go ahead and acknowledge your presence. Let me know you're here. And then I'll invite you on and we'll see if we can make this thing roll and we can have a little fun with it. We did it at six o'clock. So now I'm waiting on them. There's Mike Cottrell checking back in. It's pretty funny to kind of track this up, bit. What's what's the Palm Boss up to right now? What's the matter with that guy? Well, I'm not the smartest knife in the drawer when it comes to technology, but you know, I can talk about fish all day long. So even if, even if we can't get Bruce on here today, I'm still going to have something to talk about. I just don't know what it is yet. So in the meantime, I'm waiting for Bruce to see the uh, live video on the Palm Boss page, page, Facebook page, and then see if we can get him going so he and I can have a conversation and share some things with you guys. So... You know, I, I haven't studied this top fan thing, but I'm kind of intrigued with that. I see Mike Cottrell is one of those. Bruce Candelo is one of those. Mike Donahue is one of those. There's a number of people. There's like six people that are top Pond Boss fans. So that's kind of cool, although I know nothing about it. So, Jason, I see you checking in. And I'm, I'm on here a little early trying to get the kinks ironed out so that we can have Bruce Kanye on. So, Bruce, if you're watching here, which it doesn't look like you are. Let's see. Yep, y'all bear with me a minute. As soon as I can see that Bruce and Ann are on, then I'm going to invite them on. If not, then what I'm going to do is start talking about some things that have been going on the last couple of days. And then once they click in, I'll invite them in. So it's 629, so as soon as this thing turns over to 630, I'm gonna kick on our little ditty that everybody seems to like, unless they don't, then they haven't told me. <laughs> and then we'll start talking about some pretty cool stuff. Okay guys, it's 629, I still don't see Bruce, Kanye, and Kanye coming on. Once they do, I'll acknowledge them, then we'll invite them to come on as a guest and we'll start talking. There's Ann checking in. Let's see here, Ann. All right, now, let's see here.
Let's see here. Okay, Ann, I think you've been invited. So now you just got to accept that invitation. All right, Ann, let's see you. See you. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. It's working. There's Bruce. It's working. There's Bruce. All right. I don't know why we got an echo. Why we got an echo. But what that means to me is I'm not going to talk a lot. I'm not going to talk a lot. So, Bruce, welcome. You know what? I'm going to do this. I don't know. I thought I'd play a little bit. I thought I'd play a little bit. But this is going to be kind of weird for people to hear with this echo. So what I want to do so is just turn it over to you, and, over to you and uh, since it's kind of creepy sound in my voice, people about you, some people about my floating island, and then bring us all into this discussion, and let's hear a few things. Let's hear a few things. Well, first of all, Bob, am I coming through okay? Do I sound uh, reasonable? Or is there a major echo? Yeah, there's an echo. There's yeah. an echo from both of us. Okay. And, and when I'm on here by myself, I'm not, it doesn't happen. So I don't know if we've got something going on with your phone. With your phone. Uh, you know what? Why don't I go ahead and start the show? You guys. You guys. Look at your setting. <laughs> there's something in there. Something in there. That is causing. That is I don't know what to tell you about that. I don't know what to tell you about that. I know we're not going to do it like this because it's too much of an echo. Okay. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, sign off. Uh, sign us off for a moment. We'll restart and just get another go and see if we get lucky. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Why don't you? Why don't you hang up? Why don't you figure out something that I'm going to keep going? And then if you figure something out, if you come back on it, I'll invite you. I'll invite you. see Jason Epstad saying you can't hear either end. I bet you can hear this end, can't you? Now, there's something going on that I don't understand because we've had guests before and I don't know what the deal is. So, you know what? I'm going to kick things off. I'm going to open things up for your questions. Now, you guys know the drill. I see several of you guys doing it. I see Robbie Olds already done it. Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Click like and share this video to your Facebook page timeline. And that's going to make you eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss hat. There's one right there. Good hat. Palm Boss mug. It knows how to keep hot things hot, cold things cold. I don't know how it knows, but it does. Palm Boss resource guide is out. If you don't have one, let us know. We'll get you one. So I see Ann saying, I don't know what to do. I don't either. Um, my apologies. Bruce, I want to get you on here so we can talk about this stuff, but we've got to. I'll, I'll see what I can figure out on what's causing that echo. I may need to call somebody that knows way, way more about it than I do. So I'll work on that. So what we'll do is we'll tentatively schedule for next Wednesday night to bring Bruce on. Let's see. Jason said, I think he is using speakers and his mic built into a laptop. You know what? That may be it. That may be it. If you've got your laptop on, Bruce, and your speakers are on, on the laptop, that would create an echo. But if it's just the phone, I don't know why there would be it. So uh, <laughs> I see Jessica. Nick says he wants that hat. Hey, Nick. Papa loves you, buddy, and your sister. So let's see here. Ann is saying hi, Bob, again. So maybe they want to try it again. So let me see what we can do there. Let's try it again. Y'all bear with me a minute. I'm trying to figure this out. Okay, Ann, I'm about to add you in. So now let's try it and see if something happened. See if there's something, if that echo goes away. If the echo goes away, we'll play. So I've invited Bruce and Ann back on. So let's see if it works. Oh, look at that. Okay. Okay. There they are. So now let's see what happens. 
Volume is on mute, um, and I assume that that's a problem. What does that read there? Oops, I must have hit okay. something when I was uh, okay. when I was putting the thing on the stand. Can you, can you guys hear me? Can you guys Almost, hear me? Bob. It's just a okay. second. Okay. Still problematic, but coming on. All right, I'm gonna play with this a minute. Let's see if I can turn my volume down. Can you, can you still hear me okay? Down. Can you hear me okay, Bob? I can hear you, and it doesn't sound like it's much of an echo. Good. How's that? You sound great. I don't. You sound great. I don't. So okay. what let's do is I'm going to so just back up the step, up and you step. talk about who you are, what you do, and then let's, let's kind of start and talking about some projects you're working on and some of the little bit of history, where you've been, and what you're doing. Been, let's do that. Very good. Let's okay, Bob, so I'll take it from there. Excuse me. Uh, in any case, um, we are uh, based here in Shepherd, Montana. We've been researching around the concept of how to use fish as a strategy to clean up water. So it's a bit different than most of the pond boss fraternity. You folks are more interested in just, frankly, how to grow fish. Well, uh, what we're finding is kind of exciting. We're finding that we can take the excess nutrients associated with, usually with agriculture, but not always. There's other sources too. And we can cycle them into appropriate biota. That's a short word, but bottom line is it means we can cycle them into the fish that we enjoy so much. And we've been using our, our test uh, location here in Shepherd, a place called uh, we have a lake here called Fish Fry Lake, and that's what we've been uh, essentially trying to prove out whether or not we can make that come about. So um, over the last 15 years, uh, since approximately 2002, 2003, uh, we've been testing around that idea. And right now, I, can, I say it's, it's, it's probably um, accurate for me to state that Fish Fry Lake is the most productive wild fishery in the state of Montana. What, what that means is we can take 10 kids um, who've organized a, a series of sponsors. Uh, they, they developed a fish-a-thon approach, but bottom line is they can go out there and catch uh, 634 fish in four hours. Another case, 15 kids do the same thing, raise $10,000 with their sponsors because the fishing catch rate is so high. Uh, not just, you know, not just small fish, by the way, but fish of various age classes, fish that are remarkably healthy, they're very colorful, uh, and ultimately they're, uh, they, they demonstrate the, uh, the uh, essentially the, the healthy food web that we're all targeting. Uh, that can result in really big fish if we want to manage for that. Okay, so given that as a starting point, Bob, how are you doing right now? Can you come on at this point? Well, I can. I sure can. It's just going to echo a lot, so I'm going to listen in. So I'm going to listen in. Okay. Well, uh, the the name of what we're doing uh, is called water resource recovery, and it applies in both northern waters and southern waters. For example, let's say you're a, a pond owner or a lake owner, and you've got a uh, a fish feeding capability going on in your setting. The idea of taking the excess nutrients associated with the fish feed that made it to the bottom of your waterway uh, and or the offal from the fish that concentrate in your setting and uh, making sure that that doesn't just result in anoxic or anaerobic water that is essentially non-productive, but instead making sure that you're cycling those nutrients up and into the food web in the form of biofilm and from there to paraphyton and from there to the fish that ultimately pretty much every species vectors with, uh, that's what we do. So how do we do that? We do that by incorporating nature's wetland effect into the process. You can take nature's wetland effect and you can optimize a waterway. You can make it healthy. You can make it extremely productive. So if you're trying to grow fish, how do you incorporate nature's wetland effect into that process? You do so by providing two things, surface area and circulation. 
Um, we do it with floating islands because they offer concentrated surface area, and then we design for circulation to coordinate with that. That's what we do here on Fish Fry Lake. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, the, the, the bottom line is that it's, it's universal. It can happen in the tropics. It can happen in Alaska. It can happen everywhere in between. Uh, this idea of nature's wetland effect being a constant, being something that you as a fish manager can design for, that's the fun part about what we're doing here. You can do it anywhere. Okay, uh, so the... You know, you know, I guess I'd like to, to step back and, and uh, look at this from a 20,000-foot perspective. What is it uh, that you can do on your waterway at the very beginning to make it super productive? Um, I guess the, the starting point would be nutrients. If you understand the nutrients that are coming into your waterway, you've watched them, you understand where they inventory, where they stack up, you look at your system, trying to design whether it's short-circuiting or whether all of those nutrients are indeed cycling into your food web or not. That's a great starting point. Bob, would you, would you agree with that, or do you have some variations on the theme here that we should inject at this point? Yeah, I would. Yeah, the, I would. Uh, the, uh, one of the points that I want to make, one is, that that I make is that every one of us who have a pond have nutrient, nutrient load. load. Have it might be more nitrogen than phosphorus. In your case, it's more phosphorus than anything else. And you've got to figure out how to utilize those nutrients to keep them from causing your water quality to deteriorate to the point that everything dies. You know, and so I think what would be helpful to the listeners, Bruce, tell everybody about what floating islands are. Describe what they look like. How do you make one? And what they do in the water, and then from there, talk to them how you evolve into the point you are now. And see if that helps. Yeah, you know, Bob, that's a. Um, I, I agree that that would be helpful here. Um, floating islands are the biohaven embodiment of floating islands, which is what we do. Uh, they're made up of a filter like material. And uh, this filter-like material has a buoyancy component integrated into it. We can design for any buoyancy. We can float buildings. We can float uh, roadways or, or walkways. Uh, but ultimately, the floating islands are designed so they can provide any level of buoyancy that's needed for the other applications that we go for. But... Um, in the meantime, these islands, they're, they're designed as planting platforms. So they can grow plants of uh, a, pretty much a, a, you know, an extremely wide range of different kinds of plants, but terrestrials as well as wetland plants. We really like native, woody, fibrous plants because they are typically perennial. They'll grow their roots down into the water table. Those roots will have root hairs on them. And all of that surface area adds to this, uh, what we call sort of a, uh, an, um, you know, well, it, it, it's definitely biofilm reactive surface area, but it's an uh, upward spiral. And, you know, we're finding that the islands are colonized by all kinds of biota, nymphs uh, and uh, the various forms of invertebrate life that occur in association with paraphyton and biofilm. They all live in that, in that matrix of the island, and they kind of launch and trigger the food web. So uh, you've got this system that is a microcosm of nature's wetland effect, and you can position them all over your waterway. It's particularly strategic when you position them where inflow water happens so, uh, and or where circulation happens. When you do that, you get this multiplier effect. You essentially are developing about four and a half times more biological activity when you combine that surface area with a circulation form, whether it's gravity flow, inflow water that's coming in from up watershed or maybe the water associated with, a circula uh, with an aerator circulator system. You do this right near where you're feeding your fish, where your food pellets are occurring, where the fish offal is occurring. You've got another multiplier going in your favor. You're just going to grow more fish. 
you know. Uh, but ultimately, the islands represent so many other applications. They can beautify your waterway. They can vary your waterscape. They can give you a platform upon which to do all kinds of fun stuff. So uh, the islands are a tool. They're a way to bring nature's wetland effect pretty much to your whatever, wherever you want on your waterway. And if you do it strategically, you can turn that into this multiplier effect that results in fish growth, which is our, 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 you know, our, home, our home run when it comes to managing a fishery or a waterway around fish. That's, that's exactly right. So that's exactly what you're doing. You are adding some vertical help in the water column to extract nutrients. And before the water moves through your living island, the roots can take things up. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, whatever's in the water, and turn it into something green on top of the, of the island. While the matrix of the island and the roots are growing parasites and allergies and biofilm, that in turn feeds insects, that in turn adds to the food chain in a pond. That was very well stated, Bob. You know, uh, the, the vision of taking the excess nutrients and cycling them into something uh, other than filamentous algae, uh, cycling them into what we love about our water, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's what we're targeting here. And, and ultimately, uh, what we're finding is that those various uh, nutrients and uh, contaminants even, problematic uh, compounds that somehow get into our waterway, you know, from up watershed, uh, we're able to take those and mitigate them. We're able to, to climb them up, to block them off, to get them out of the picture so that they're not influencing, the, you know, the quality of our fish. So they're not accumulating in that fat zone along the spinal uh, column of the fish uh, and instead are being biosequestered within the plant life and the other life forms that we're cycling into the food web here. So there's a lot of, uh, of you know, side benefits connected with what we're talking about. But ultimately, one thing we have to bear in mind here, the home run, the thing that we're always targeting is nature's, uh, uh, well, we call it the wetland effect, nature's natural way of cycling nutrients up and into and out of the system. You got to keep them moving. If they stack up, problems happen. Dead water happens. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm constantly reminded of, of this because the work we do so often is associated with harmful algae blooms. And when that happens up here in the north, literally the whole lake can go away. In a matter of a day or two, you can deoxygenate a massive waterway and all your fish die. All that investment and all the energy you put into managing a waterway to make it a wonderful setting, a place that you love to be around, it can go away in a matter of a day or two if it's not appropriately stewarded away from those harmful algae blooms, which have this boom-bust cycle that results in deoxygenation of your water. So um, I'm curious, Bob, about your perspective of why we fight these harmful algae blooms to such a great extent here in the north, but maybe you aren't in the south. It's hard to imagine because the added heat units and everything else that you've got going on there, what's the difference between what we're doing here or what we're fighting here and what we're experiencing here and what you're doing in the South? Well, we're starting well, to see it more we're starting and, to more. See more uh, and more. And more. Uh, I think plus, you've got think such, an you've got such an imbalance between nutrients that we don't have. That we don't have. You know, you. I think in a lot of cases where the harmful algae blooms are going on, there's just not enough nitrogen in the water. We're nitrogen heavy. We're nitrogen. You know, and you guys comparatively are phosphorus heavy. I think with those two nutrients are upside down, they're not balanced. Which gives the harmful algae blooms the advantage. You know, so just might, echo wasn't it was just and I don't echo know what to do about it, so we're going to live with it. it. Uh, Blue-green algae, uh, we're blue seeing algae, more and more of that more more than we that. did 10 years ago. We did 10 well, years but not to the extent we're seeing, the you know, in the north part of the nation. You know, for your, for, the, for the, the folks that are listening in here, one point to bear in mind is that algae or phytoplankton 
can fix its own nitrogen. So it's not nitrogen limited. That means that if there's, um, for, you know, here's the red field ratio, 106 carbon, 16 nitrogen, one phosphorus. You compare that ratio to what you'll see on a bag of fertilizer. It's way out of balance, way out in favor of phosphorus, by the way. And what we are doing, we have this intensive farming going on up here in the north. You're right. We absolutely experienced a, an incredible imbalance of phosphorus. And nitrogen, I mean, the phytoplankton can fix its own nitrogen. It doesn't even need nitrogen in the water because it can pull it from the air. So you sure. get some phosphorus and you've turned it loose. And that applies both in the north and the south. But I think part of what you're saying, and I agree totally with it, is that in the south you've got so many more grow days, so much more you know, so much more solar energy and, and thermal units going on that you can cycle a lot more of that out of your water than we can here in the north in our limited growing season. Maybe that's really what it's about. But ultimately, boy, it's uh, you know, we're finding that if we can we can turn that into an advantage, we can turn that into fish. Uh, and we do it by concentrating nature's wetland effect into the waterway so that we're cycling nutrients at a far greater rate than we were before in the same waterway. And ultimately, I think that might get us out of this fix until we learn how to handle fertilizer. I mean, you know what? I see here, you here is know what? is ready to get a plankton bloom, a good healthy algae, phytoplankton bloom going by about, about, about the first of April. And we don't see the harmful algae blooms until July, June, July. July, June, July, 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 July. If the phytoplankton bloom loses, loses, loses its productivity and shifts. And when it shifts, it's almost it always shifts, just almost to where blue green algae have the opportunity to dominate. So we get a little boost so we get with a little slow boost. rise in water so temperatures where I got a feeling in the north, I've seen it. When the water temperatures go from, you know, 39 to 42 to 61. And ours doesn't do that. Ours goes up typically, slowly. And then we're able to get a good final place to blow that matures into a dull place to blow. And when that's going on, everything stays balanced. But when it shifts, the water is hot, it changes. You know, Bob, in the last edition of Pond Boss, I read that article you wrote. I remember it being page 44. I, I, uh, for some reason, my mind remembers page numbers more so than titles. But in, in any case, uh, you wrote this, you, you described how, you know, the difference between an appropriate bloom and a bad bloom. You know, the bright, there it is. Fertilizer, fertilizer or not. Thank you, Bob. In any case, <laughs> the, the, the bottom line is that what you're describing of the healthy bloom is essentially diatom-based paraphyton occurring. And, you know, you get this brownish-green color. It can even have a reddish hue to it at times. Those are, and here's the difference between diatoms, which are a form of phytoplankton, and blue-green algae. Diatoms are, uh, they're older. They've been around far longer. They've been dominating our oceans for 250 million years. They are what works. Blue-green algae is a new kid. It's been around forever, but it's never been dominating because of, but because of this incredible supply of phosphorus, it's going crazy. But in the meantime, diatoms have a unique feature. They are almost steady state in terms of dissolved oxygen production. This is dramatically different than the blue-greens, which have this feast or famine system where they explode into huge profusion, but then when they die, use up the dissolved oxygen and wipe out the air breathers in a waterway. So there's the difference. You want to design for diatom-based paraphyton. I hope we're not getting too scientific here, but ultimately, the bottom line is that your article about showing people, here's what you want, here's what you don't want, that was perfect. I want to thank well, you thanks. for that. Well, thanks. 
couple of things. I had to go back and look at it. I had to go back and look at it. Hey, you know what? There's several guys hey, you know what? advising us here that if you, if you can turn the volume down on your phone, down the on echo your may phone, go away. The echo may go away. So, do you know how to so, turn the volume down on the, on the top of your phone? On the, on the top of your phone? Try that. We're doing our volume oh, no, is way down. Here's the volume right there. <laughs> <laughs> and see if you can turn the volume down and on your phone. It's red down. Yeah, it's stuck it's mute. Yeah. We're right up against oh mute, Bob. <laughs> this is weird. I don't know what I say. Ah. You know, on the side of the phone, where you have a little volume control button. We're about as low as you can turn it all the way down. Get yeah, that. Turn as it all down as far down as you can go. We can barely hear you, actually. Yeah, I'm. I'm at the point here where where um, I can hear you, but I have to lean forward to do so. Okay. okay. Am I echoing okay. that pretty badly? Okay. I can hear you just fine. So if you want to turn it up, we're going to have this echo. Turn it up, we're gonna have this and it may be, it may be in the settings. And you know what? We're just going to live with it for now. We'll, we'll deal with this later. Tonight. We'll later. So why don't you bring so some people, people through kind of the evolution from going from floating islands and the conceptual parts of the reality of what actually happens and then shift gear and start telling people a little bit more about what you're working on right now. What you're working on right now. You know, that's a fun topic because. Because uh, uh, I run a company called Floating Island International. We've got some 8,000 islands uh, um, all over the world. Um, the largest of our islands is 51,000 square feet in a place called Lake Rotorua. Um, the, uh, that, that's in New Zealand, by the way. Uh, but we have dozens of big systems, 20, you know, 25, 30,000 square foot systems in uh, New Zealand. Uh, and Singapore, and then uh, some here in the U.S. We've done some big projects for Army Corps, uh, but perhaps one of my favorite areas to work in is, is fishery enhancement. Um, and in fact, uh, as we're talking about it right now, you, you know, I can appreciate the idea that, that there are many of us that have um, a, a real love uh, for water and for being around it and for what it you know, I think uh, humans are animals of the fringe. If you look at where the human population occurs, you'll find that 90% of us live within 20 miles of major water. Um, and th there's a reason for that. You know, but, but I guess the, you know, the point I'm getting at here is that we've been, with our islands, we've been targeting solutions. We've been helping people solve their water problems. Uh, that was then. Today is different. Today, we're looking at water as, and what's in it as a resource. So we're actually uh, targeting revenue from water. So if you can take a lake, uh, even a private pond or a private waterway, and you can cycle nutrients into appropriate, valuable biota, what does that look like? That looks like landscape trees, that looks like tree cuttings, that looks like valuable wetland plants, that looks like solar energy, and that looks like forage fish, like the fathead minnow. Uh, we've been using this water resource recovery strategy with floating islands to actually generate revenue from water. Um, I, I'll, I'll just expand on a couple of those, but, but minnows would be a terrific example of that. Fathead minnows, just yesterday I, I pulled up uh, – uh, a K trap, a clover leaf system from Minnow Pond. It was about six feet out in the water, and I pulled it up and had maybe a thousand of a native form of stickleback that we have here called five prong stickleback. There are some forms of stickleback that aren't considered desirable in some settings, but for me here in Montana, the five prong uh, is an incredibly valuable forage fish. Uh, I introduced that into Fish Fry Lake, and I can use that a five prong stickleback to condition my fish to come to a particular spot so I can feed cut bait or whatever I want to into them experimentally here as I'm doing my slot limit program and trying to enhance for certain fish. I kind of like those 17 inch black crappie, frankly, you know, uh, although I'm okay with a pound and a half a bluegill or maybe a, a red ear sunfish pushing two pounds. Uh, th those are, I, I like those just fine. Yeah, uh, but ultimately here, the, uh, the bottom line is that you can, you can actually, by 
tracking uh, your nutrient load in your waterway uh, and understanding it, you can target it and cycle those nutrients into biota that is appropriate instead of the harmful algae blooms, which will occur otherwise. I mean, it's not like we have a choice, folks. You get one or the other. Water resource recovery is essentially targeting those nutrients and catching them, cycling them into something better, something valuable. Um, you know, what are you going to do with, you know, we put a, our standard template unit, which is a hundred square foot, I mean, a, a hundred foot long uh, by a 15 foot wide, 1500 square foot. It's a foot thick. You can walk on it. You can work on it. We incorporate a floating stream bed in the middle of that. We use solar power to run it. And the whole system can take a waterway and cycle huge volumes of nutrients back up and into appropriate biota. Any one of those things, whether it be, again, trees, plants, fish, solar energy, all of the above. So that's water resource recovery. Okay, so now... Let's okay, say that so somebody watching and showing and participating. What do they need to do? What do they need to do? How do they find out more about it? Is it on the website? Do you have a newsletter? How do you convey this information to people? Well, today we're 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 you know we're an invention group. I'm an inventor, uh, and I love the idea of new approaches to getting problems solved. So. A few years ago, we were looking at the idea, okay, how do we raise money for this effort around water research, uh, water resource recovery? And we discovered that uh, recently there's been a movement around um, what's called uh, equity funding for uh, startups. And we decided, okay, well, we will launch a subsidiary. We'll call it Water RR, Water Resource Recovery. We'll take it to one of these portals and we'll let them raise money on our behalf for water resource recovery. And we'll target one of the low hanging fruit sectors, uh, which is lagoon based wastewater. Bear in mind that we can work in all kinds of different water. We can work in lakes and ponds. Uh, we can work in storm water, all of the above, but, Water resource recovery is specifically targeting lagoon-based wastewater. So imagine a small village of 1,000 people or 1,500 people or 800 people, uh, and they've got lagoon-based wastewater. We can go into their setting, and we can generate revenue for them, revenue that pays for the project. But over and above that, guess what? The byproduct of what it does? Cleaner water. So... The byproduct is water quality. On the other hand, the system pays for itself. That's, that's our message. That's what essentially we're driving right now through this new uh, equity crowdfunding approach run by a portal called Start Engine. And you can look up Water RR Start Engine on Google, and it'll take you right to uh, that page that will describe in detail what we're talking about, what we're doing. And boy, it's fun. And so if people want to invest, they so can. People want to invest, they but can. what they're investing in is but a company or they're going to own shares, shares or an equity in your research and development where you're going to work with small towns and their, their, their wastewater treatment plants like in the final stage of their water treatment to extract nutrients, turn them into something like planted meadows or tomatoes or landscape plants that the city can use as a median on the town square. Actually, tomatoes are a bit of a stretch there, Bob. But <laughs> Oh, well. At least here oh, in North America. You, and anyway. You think it'd be trying to sell tomatoes out of the way from the way from the way from the way Perhaps. <laughs> uh, but, but in any case, the, I think you've, caught, you've captured the gist of what we're talking about. You know, waterrr.com takes you, dot co, waterrr.co. You can tell I'm really um, IT conversant here, but water, uh, waterrr.co gets you to our website and explains all that in detail. 
um, you know, it, it's a uh, one thing I want to say, I guess, is that uh, I I have uh, been watching your industry, Bob, the, this concept of the private pond fishery, the private lake fishery, and the energy around growing the next world record largemouth bass. Uh, I, I predict that uh, somebody, or maybe more than one, uh, these folks are, that are after this, that are targeting this, are going to connect with the mineral production associated with water RR. They're going to incorporate that into their fishery enhancement program, and they're going to grow world record. They're going to grow record fish because the forage base that we can generate from those nutrients that are today being squandered, that are being allowed to cycle into harmful algae blooms, they're going to cycle them instead into big fish. And boy, it's an incredible, uh, imminent opportunity. It's really fun to think about. In fact, I'm, I'm hoping the local, uh, there, there's a legume-based system near here that we're talking with right now. And guess where I fully intend to take those minnows once, they, um, once we, we turn that into a successful project? Of course, I'm going to cycle them right into Fish Fry Lake. That makes good sense. So that makes good sense. So where you're going is, is where you're going is, is good pond management. Is good pond management. Some of their nutrients some of their into plants, into plants. Maybe some of those plants in the flesh, which may be converted into food and up the chain of the food chain. The probable pond. What you're saying is, with the tools that you've invented, that you're working on, pond meisters can spend some money on this. In other words, Bob, you've hit it right on the head. Turn what will be a problem into a terrific advantage in terms of fish growth. You know, the, the reality is we have the science. We know how to do it. We've been doing it. We've got lots of history behind us. If you were to lift all the research be, behind what I've been talking about, uh, you'd develop some serious biceps. Bottom line is that, that uh, all you know, take, take, a, you know, take, take a few minutes. minutes. And I'm fascinated with what's happened with Fish Fry Lake. Why don't you take a few minutes and tell people about the floating islands on Fish Fry Lake, describe it, and visual, you know, where people can see it, and then tell them what you've been harvesting the last few years as you convert that phosphorus and biomass. What does that mean? What does that mean to us? Okay, uh, I'm going to bomb you with data here over the next few minutes, and, and I apologize in advance for those folks that, that uh, uh, don't necessarily appreciate that end of it, but it's me, right? Um, ultimately, we started with a six-and-a-half-acre uh, uh, seasonal waterway. I, I dammed it up. Uh, now it became perennial. Uh, we filled it up the first time, and it was – literally 100 percent 95 98 percent anyway coated with filamentous algae there'd be patches of orange black green uh cyanobacteria in there too i would not let my dogs drink from the water i was afraid that would there be toxins there that could kill them uh, that's what we started with we knew we had this nutrient overload so we said, how do we turn that into something better? How do we turn that into something positive? Um, back then, the water clarity would be as low as 14 inches. Today, water clarity can be as much as 19 feet. The key point here is that that's only because the nutrients that would have otherwise resulted in TSS, uh, all kinds of particulates in the water, uh, all of those are now being directed into appropriate biota, appropriate life forms. Not just fish, but those woody, fibrous, perennial plants that we like so well, the beautiful islands that cover the pond, that waterscape it. Uh, imagine marsh milkweed, uh, or uh, there's a couple forms of wetland sunflower that we love and that grow eight feet high, and the pollinators that are associated with that, and the damselflies and the dragonflies and their nymph forms. 
these are reflective of that upward spiral. You get under the islands, and you get incredible concentrations of fish. You'll see freshwater sponge occurring, uh, literally colonizing into the matrix of the islands. Freshwater sponge, native life form, air breather, by the way, uh, it actually filters, helps us as we are engaged in this upward spiral, but it helps us further clarify the water. And that's here. Uh, I mean, it, it was a surprise. We didn't put it in. It found its way here. Uh, and we're literally allowing nature to help us. That's part of the energizing part of this whole thing here is that we're setting the stage by providing that blend of surface area and circulation, and nature takes it from there and helps us out in a huge way. Our islands are just a form of that. And I, I don't want to suggest that islands are the only way to achieve what we're talking about. They aren't. There are dozens of ways to incorporate surface area and circulation into your waterways. Uh, islands just happen to be the way I do it. Uh, and we, we represent a solution. We can help you fix problems. But ultimately, we're really about turning our system around so that we're taking advantage of the nutrients that we inadvertently put in water and we're cycling them up and into a food web into appropriate life forms that we love. You know, um, Fish Fry Lake today is, I say it's the best fishery in Montana. Um, it's hard to gauge that because there are, there are very few other people like me that track this kind of data. Uh, I wish there were more. But ultimately, when we, we got our catch rate as a fish every minute and a half, uh, and that's improved from a fish every three or four minutes just a, a few years back. But the big, the major point is these aren't just stunted bluegills or something like that. They're pretty much a, a vast range of age classes, uh, seven or eight different key species of game fish that we grow. Um, well, red ear sunfish, bluegill, largemouth bass, northern yellow perch, black crappie, on from there. You know, uh, ultimately, we're a warm water uh, fishery, uh, and, and we're designing to make sure that the forage base, which in our case is primarily um, northern yellow perch, they are the fish that we use, that we enhance for specifically, that and the fathead minnow. Uh, to, to, to really charge up and fire up our fishery. Uh, part of the reason for that, by the way, is that our northern bass don't get as big as your bass down south. And, it, you know, it's challenging to, for these, for our bass to eat uh, a, you know, a bluegill that's a year and a half old. It just doesn't fit in their maw, you know. Whereas the, the, the northern yellow perch, uh, it can be two and a half, three years old and still fit within a, bass, a northern bass's mouth. So we're designing around the perch. We like that perch. We don't have gizzard shad. We don't have golden shiners. Uh, we're trying to stay native and local as much as we can. Um, but ultimately, uh, we, you know, we're, we're focused around the yellow perch and the fathead minnow to, to fire up our fishery and to keep driving it. Well, tell people a little bit about the numbers of fish that you harvest typically every fall just to keep up with the nutrient load. Yeah, in, in fact, we look at it on an acre foot of water basis. So Fish Fry Lake is about 55 acre feet of water, and we harvest around 27 or 28 pounds of fish per acre foot. So if you do the math on that, that'll show you what we're doing. We do it on a slot limit basis whereby we send the big fish back because we want them to be there for people to catch. But the smaller fish, the one and two year old fish, we pull out. What do we do with them? You know, uh, I'm looking at one of our yellow labs right now, but, but um, we dry those fish. We air dry them and uh, we cycle them into dog treats. Uh, they're, when they're, they've not been cooked or anything, they're simply air dried uh, and they're crunchy. And we've been feeding that to our fish for years now. Uh, and uh, they, they love my, we've, we've got these paleo dogs that are paleo healthy and it's been great. <laughs> Oh, okay. Now, huh, okay. When you're harvesting those fish, when you're harvesting those fish, describe, kind of paint the picture paint of the what's picture. happening when you're so doing that. Happening. You have kids you're out there catch them, them, or you trap them, or, them, or, them, or, them, or, them, or how, how are you doing that? All of the above, I I literally seek out fisher people. 
we're thinking of running another fishathon here uh, at the end of May, and we're going to use it to generate money for science, essentially. Uh, we're going to fund science uh, around this process of water resource recovery. But we'll probably catch a couple thousand fish over the course of a day uh, from a six and a half acre lake, essentially. And we'll do, you know, then I'm, I'm out there and friends are out there and we're harvesting fish, including my wife, Anna. <laughs> uh, but, but ultimately, you go out and an hour later, you've got, you know, 100 fish and you've, you've uh, edited through them. You turn the big ones back and you've kept the, big, the short ones. We turn them and process them in the cut bait. We feed a fraction back into the lake. We then dry another fraction. So we've got this nutrient cycling. The key point is harvest. You can't not harvest. If you don't harvest, if you simply let the other predator hierarchy step forward, you're skipping part of your responsibility as a component of the food web. So, uh, I'm looking at, you know, I, I view things uh, from the perspective of uh, we humans are part of the food web and we have a certain responsibility, a component of which is, and since we're pretty much at top of the food web, we are, we're, we're a component of the harvest uh, cycle here. And uh, in fact, uh, Anne is currently feeding um, there, there's no way to put that on the camera right now because of the angle of the camera and stuff. But, but ultimately, you know, it, it's, uh, l let me leave it at that. Just to say that, that uh, harvest uh, is something you need to look at and work through. Uh, it, once you understand your nutrient load, your inflow nutrient concentrations, you can then calculate. We can model for you, by the way. We can show you exactly what it takes for your system to be optimized. For your system to be as productive as it can be. These are exciting times, Bob, because we can model. We can say, here's your water weight. Answer these questions. We'll come back to you with a report that says, here's what you need to do for your system to be operating at an optimal level. Producing huge fish if that's your target. When you, uh, when you add them all up, when you add at the end of the year, year are you taking six and a half acres? Well, 55 times 27 will end up being up in a range of 13 or 1400 pounds coming off that six and a half acre lake. So you're, you're harvesting every year 1300 pounds of fish and taking them out. And with the system you've got in place, you're on that many more next year to replace. Yeah. Well, plus that. <laughs> You know, that's a stunning, that's a stunning that's number. A stunning, We're just barely keeping number. up. And, and uh, you know, bear in mind here, Bob, the inverse of that. That's what you do if you're a WRR system. If you don't do that, then what happens? Then what happens? You want to have algae bloom. You or yeah, algae bloom. You, know, you yeah, might discover you might have some monoculture of, of uh, milfoil or something going on. Um, so you've got, so you've so got, you've got, so you've got, Sequestering of nutrients, sequestering converting, of them, nutrients, into converting them into something, something can eat. Something can eat. And your water clarity is and up to 19 feet, to and, and you're taking 1,300 pounds, pounds of meat out of that six and a half acre lake every fall. That that's it exactly. Now let me make this point. Today we know that there's oligotrophic, there's mesotrophic. There's eutrophic, then there's hyper-eutrophic waterways. There's one more classification of, of water out there that we aren't seeing in the literature quite yet, and that is transition water. That's water that takes a hyper-eutrophic or a eutrophic setting and cycles those nutrients out of the water so that the outflow from that waterway is actually better than the inflow water in terms of nutrient concentrations, lower concentrations. So imagine having the productivity of a eutrophic waterway combined with the water quality of an oligotrophic waterway. That's transition water. And frankly, that's a home run because it gives us the water quality. Instead of looking at turbid water, water you're not sure you want to swim in, 
Now you can swim in totally clear water, but your fish productivity is bonkers. Transition water. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Troy Todd's asking a question. Do you feed in your fish fish food? Do you feed in your fish fish food? You know, I, 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 only in the sense that we'll take a portion of our slot-limited harvest and we'll cycle them back into fish. For example, I'll cut up some of the one- and two-year-old fish and I'm playing with feeding them back into red ear sunfish, black crappie, and largemouth bass, and yellow perch. So uh, and the, we use the fat heads and the sticklebacks to condition the fish to come to a specific site so that we can do that. I just did it for the first time last year. I love how it's working. I'd like to repeat it, maybe do it seven or eight different locations around the lake. Just to you know, to expand on that because the the again the growth rates on our fish are awesome. Um, I could talk about growth rates on yellow perch, which I'd measured, but ultimately they were off the chart, you know. Uh, and the idea of doing this purposefully by siphoning the 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 uh, slot limited fish into those bigger guys, that's a lot of fun. So you don't feed any commercial you fish food. Commercial You're depending on your lake You're to on your use lake. its own nutrients that you can work in a non-traditional way into the more flesh. Exactly. In other words, I get my nutrients for free from up watershed. Tell people how the, where the water comes from. And you're sitting on the shores of the Yellowstone River, and you've got real porous soils, rocky soils, and corn country. So the phosphorus is coming from where? You know what? We're going to figure out this day. You know what? We're going to figure out this everybody. And we're going to have another conversation on another day. Tell people where your water comes from and why you've got so much phosphorus, and then we're going to start wrapping things up. Okay. Um, we're on what are, what's called the Billings Bench Irrigation System. We're at the very tail end. We are the last outfit on the ditch, um, us and our neighbor. The water comes into the ditch 70 miles up watershed off the Yellowstone River. It then flows through very intensively farmed uh, ag ground in the city of Billings, too, uh, and ultimately uh, into my property. So uh, it's getting both uh, ag, nutrient load, and stormwater associated with the waterways and, and the infiltration into the ditch from up watershed. Um, the, and so when uh, the farmers uh, irrigate with the water, whatever the plants don't take up, fairly quickly percolates through the soil, turns laterally and downhill and runs through kind of an underwater conduit and flows right through your property. They're in, irrigating both above and below the ditch. And that portion of the water that's irrigating above the ditch ends up some of it gets back into the ditch, uh, but ultimately that's uh, that's a component of what's going on here. You'll have actual inflows that go out and come back into the ditch and on and on from there. But yeah, that so we're getting these these uh, the free nutrients or free fish food if, if based on how we're dealing with it today from uh, the um, applications that are going on up watershed from here. That's 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 great stuff. We need to do this more. We're gonna figure out. Everybody, we're gonna figure out this echo and how to get rid of it. So we're gonna have uh, where we can have some more exchange between Bruce and I. So in the meantime, Bruce, tell everybody how they can contact you. You, you want email, phone calls, website? How do people get in touch with you if they have some questions? Well, I I know it's not normal here, but I'm gonna provide a phone number, a landline, which is frankly. My my favorite way of connecting just because the lines are clear and less, you know, it's just easier to work with, but area code 406-373-5200. That's area code 406-373-5200 or Bruce at floating Island international.com. Um, any of those work bottom lines. Don't hesitate to call. I love to talk about fish and uh, I, uh, and, and frankly, the, the, you know, the bottom line here, Bob, as I want to restate, just state again that the work you're doing is so practical, it's so down to earth, it's so real, and it is so vital and so important uh, that ultimately you are, you're really well positioned to help lead our country into water resource recovery. We need it. It's necessary. 
Well, I'm intrigued. I want to hear more about it. And we'll have another conversation. So I'm going to say adios and thank you for joining us tonight. You and I are going to get back together and figure out how to get rid of this echo so we can carry on a conversation and make it more attractive to more people. And we'll meet again and we'll talk about it some more. Thanks, Bob, as always. All right. See you later. Appreciate it. Check in with you guys next Wednesday. Stay tuned. Appreciate you spending your time with us tonight. Adios. Adios.